This is Game Chat Born, episode 133. A Tale of Two Rants. Oh boy. You found Game Chat with Buona. Welcome to the show. Now here's your host, Buona McCall, with all the gaming news of this week. Uh, by the way, that's me. Greetings, folks, and welcome to episode 133 of Game Chat with Buona. We got a great show lined up for you. Welcome to the show. Today is April. Well, March is over. I warned you guys. April 3rd. 2019 and always man every I've, I've been doing this a long time and every time i do a show close to april fools finding stuff to talk about is always difficult because there's so much jokes and gags and just fake news out there but today's show is actually it's going to be easier in a, in a kind of way um it's we're we're, on, we're only going to focus on two stories and the reason why i'm doing that is because they're so beefy and juicy that uh, it's just going to warrant the entire time. I, I had some other stories lined up. We were going to talk about some stuff with Valve and Artifact and their their reimagining of that. You can go look that up. Uh, Minecraft broke, you know, they, they posted some numbers about their sales. We were going to talk a little bit about that and a couple other stories. But today we're only going to focus on two major topics. The first being the Borderlands 3 announcement and all the stuff surrounding that. That could go on. <laughs> that could be a long conversation. And the last is going to be even a longer one is about Anthem and what possibly went wrong. A big, big post on Kotaku is going to be probably the main focus of this show. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, tea, water, something and enjoy the show. Let's do it. For our first story, we're going to talk about Borderlands. Borderlands has been unleashed upon the world. Borderlands 3, that is. A long-awaited title. Uh, this past week, we've both both heard about the, the announcement of the series coming out. And yesterday, uh, actually, I think it was today, uh, the official release date has been announced. So uh, Borderlands 3 is going to be in the same vein as the other Borderlands games. Uh, it's been a long time coming. A lot of hype surrounding this. A lot of anticipation. Uh, especially be behind the, the lackluster release of the, pre the prequel, pre-series, prequel thing. That a lot of people <laughs> don't feel was a, a very, very great Borderlands game. But some people like it. Well, you know, that's, that's a whole opinionated thing. But Borderlands 3, the announcement trailer came out. It is officially coming out on September 13th of this year on the Epic Game Store exclusively. Yeah. And that's what we're going to focus on this this topic a little bit more. It, it's, it's something that's going to be a little bit tiring. I know some of you, uh, you probably like, oh my God, he's going to talk about it. Yeah, I am. Because I, like, I, th I feel like this needs to be discussed because it's a problem. It is a problem. Um, and it may not be the problem that you think I'm going to talk about. Uh, and it is going to be a, a six month six month exclusive on the Epic Game Store, uh, and it'll be available in other stores in April 2020. Uh, this story comes by WebDiverse.com, but it's all over the internet. It's everywhere. So okay, Borderlands Three, we we kind of saw it coming. I mean, they do use the Epic Engine, they do use Unreal, and uh, I do believe that you know anybody that uses Unreal. These, in this day and age, they're going to be looking at the Epic Game Store as a, a very attractive offer. Not just publishers, not just people who, who, who write the checks, but I think developers in, in tandem will be saying, hey, maybe we should seriously look, in at, look at this Epic Game Store as a possible option. Now, with that said, I agree with a lot of the naysayers on the Internet, and I'll try to keep the naysayers... And uh, the 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 the, uh, the court of public opinion and the and just the the wild varying opinions out there. I'll try to keep that at bay and just talk about how I feel about things. And rather rather than a reaction to the the nonsense, I think I'll just talk about how I feel about it. Mostly, I can understand, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to keep it to this. I can understand why people don't like the Epic Game Store. It is very feature bare at the moment. It reminds me of the very, very early days of, of Steam. 
back in 2004 when I joined it. Uh, yes, it's been that long. And Steam was very bare, basically had two or three games on it, no features, nothing. It, it was just a, a bare launcher slash storefront. You, you barely call it a launcher. It was just a storefront. And uh, it had a lot of DRM. And back then, DRM didn't exist with a lot of stuff with video games. Um, it was very, it was frowned upon quite a bit for a lot of different reasons. And that took a long time. It took probably five to maybe 10 years for people to ease up on steam. And even to this day, people still don't like steam that much because of the DRM. Epic game store is something that you, it, is there's reason not to prefer it. I should say not, I wouldn't say not like it, but not to prefer it. Because it doesn't have a lot of the things that you're used to, especially if you're been using Steam your whole life <clears throat> and your your whole viewpoint of video games on PC surrounds Steam. It doesn't have a lot of the features. It doesn't have forums. It doesn't have uh, Workshop, which I think is a big deal. Steam Workshop with mod support is probably one of the best things about Steam. Um, it doesn't have a peer review system, which, you know, that could be argued as being a good or bad thing. I don't know, depending on your on your viewpoint. Um, and it doesn't have as a robust friend and uh, community system. With that said, Epic has committed to building out these things in the future. But, you know, gamers are looking at the now. They're not looking at the future. So when you, when you hear about Borderlands 3 being on the Epic Game Store, not on Steam, immediately people point to the things that will possibly be missing. They go, Borderlands 3 ain't going to have any kind of mod or workshop support. Borderlands 3 is not going to have a community forum built in. Borderlands 3 is not going to have good multiplayer. And some people argue, again, I'm going to try to keep this as minimal as possible about the naysayers, that the Epic Game Store has bad account security. And I just laugh at that. I don't know if I think it could be a short term memory thing or something. But over the years, Steam and security issues and account stealing and loot boxes and Counter Strike stuff and Dota stuff and people's accounts being hacked via messages and accounts being hijacked and scams has been off the freaking charts. So I'll just I'll just lead with that. That Steam's account security ain't all roses and gravy either. I mean, we recently got two-factor on Steam like in the past couple of years, right? So people argue that the Epic Game Store has poor security. They also argue that Epic Game Store has poor customer support, of which I can agree. Having been a victim of their, uh, their customer support, uh, with my wife's Fortnite, Fortnite account being banned for no reason and pretty much being tossed out. Yes, I agree with that point. So there, I, I definitely agree with the, the customer support being terrible. There's no refund support. Right built in, baked into the shop. You have to actually, in, you know, you have to, I think it's request a, a customer support ticket to get a refund. So it's kind of sloppy. So Epic Game Store is like Steam in the early days. It's the point I'm making here. It's like Steam in the early days and in some ways better, in some ways worse. Um, and it's an evolution, pro evolution process. If you've watched Fortnite, if you've watched how they're treating a lot of their things at Epic now, it's a very iterative, very, very agile development type of environment where they iterate quickly. They add features quickly based on customer feedback, but they start small and they build up from that based on their GDC talks. That's what they're going to go in the future. They're going to slowly add features on an as-needed basis and not throw everything in the kitchen sink at once. So it's easy to say that when Borderlands 3 has been announced as an exclusive on the Epic Game Store that, man, we're going to miss all these things. But you're forgetting, if you're thinking that way, you're forgetting a giant part of video games. And that's the video game itself. PC gaming right now is in the battle with console exclusivity, which means that games like The Last of Us, games like uh, uh, God of War, we don't even see those games on PC, period. 
which frustrates me as a gamer that I am stuck behind hardware exclusivity. PC gaming today has a multitude of stores. We have the Epic Gaming Store that we're talking about. We got Steam. We got Uplay. These are storefronts. We got Origin. We've got a bunch of different ones. Bethesda had their launcher for a while, but they gave up on that. We've got all these different stores. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, I can play on my PC hardware, which is choice. Not only do I have choice of peripherals, inputs, uh, a bunch of other stuff, but I have choice of which storefront I want to use and which choice of games I want to play and how I want to play them. Now, these different storefronts and these different ecosystems have their own separate friends lists, which is annoying. They have their own separate launchers, which is annoying. And they have their own separate DRM principles and customer support, customer stores, refund policies, which is annoying. But at the end of the day, I can play the video game I want to play on my PC. I really think gamers need to ground themselves and think about it from that perspective. Oh, no, I can't play this game because it's not on Steam is a really, really shallow and narrow minded view of where we are today in the gaming as a whole. Like I said, look at console exclusivity versus PC. That's something to be upset about. Having to download a mediocre and less feature rich store to play the game, which is why you're doing this to play the actual game, not the things surrounding the game, not the friends list, not the forums, not the mods, but they actually play the game. You can play the game. Period. That should be it. And it's so frustrating to hear to hear a lot of complaints about Epic in particular, where Steam does the same thing or has done the same thing in the past and are doing worse things. When the term anti-consumer comes up in this conversation, I think about loot boxes and I think about keys and I think about cosmetics on Steam. I think about the marketplace. You know what else I think about, which is probably the most anti-consumer thing on Steam. I'm sorry, the most anti-consumer thing that I can think of in PC gaming today is the Steam Marketplace. If you buy and sell on the Steam Marketplace, your money is trapped. It is literally held hostage. You can't use it on anything else but what's on Steam. When you fill your Steam wallet, that money is trapped. You can't do anything else with it. You can't withdraw it. You can't, you can't get it back. Like, oops, I want this money back. I bought the Steam card, but I want the money back. No, you got to request a refund on the whole thing. If you sell something on there that they have valued as real money, it's stuck and trapped on that marketplace. Which to me is not a good thing. Is You really shouldn't want that elsewhere on other systems. Sure, I, I, I mean, I could get behind like loyalty point systems like Uplay does. Not Uplay. Yeah, you play. They do, they do loyalty point systems where you, if you do things on their ecosystem, you get rewarded with points that you can use to re, to redeem with rewards, to get discounts on games. I can get behind that. That's OK. That's a, that's something to get me to use the system. But when you start talking about freaking real dollars and you trap it behind a marketplace, that's something to complain about. And I don't like it about Steam. But here's the thing. If I don't like something about that part of a ecosystem or marketplace it does not affect me playing Sekiro it does not affect me playing Warframe I still can play those games at the end of the day I am a gamer I am not a marketplacer I am not a community -er. I am not a workshopper I am a gamer I want to play the video game nothing in the epic game store that I've been, I've been using it for quite a while, has prevented me from doing that. Like I said, we had I had a, a couple spats with the customer service, and it's not like I haven't had that on Steam. Steam has had their problems. Origin has had their problems. You, oh, let's go back in time, shall we? Origin and Uplay, they had some really bumpy launches. I mean, Uplay, the word rootkit comes to mind. You remember that? The Uplay DRM was found to have a rootkit on it twice. We forgave them and moved on. 
I really believe that the 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 the, the reasoning that people put forth to say they're limiting my cho- limiting my choice, therefore it is bad. On the PC platform, it is all about choice. Okay. What people are complaining about is not choice to play a game because you can play the game. That's the big deal here. You're buying a game. You can play the game. They're talking about the ecosystem that they play the game in. The environment that they play the game in. The, the, the walled garden that their game that surrounds their game. By... Offering an exclusivity clause to developers, they believe that Epic, the Epic Game Store, I'm trying to limit all these rebuttal arguments, but they believe that the Epic Game Store is anti-consumer and limiting their choice. Now, certain facets and parts of that, I can agree with the concern and the dislike. What I don't agree with is the elevated amount of hatred And the justification for boycott. Because one of the most popular games on PC right now is called Apex Legends. You can't play Apex Legends on Steam. One of the other popular games that you can play on PC that you can't play on Steam is called Fortnite. These are games that you cannot play. FIFA, one of the most popular games in the entire world, you can't play on Steam. So why has the Steam wall garden become so important now? It's been elevated to a new status that it should not be in, honestly. Steam is not that good. I hate to break it to you. Steam is not that good. You may have invested a lot of time and money. You have a lot of games on Steam. You have a lot of investment, but that doesn't make it good. It has a large feature set because it's been around for 15 years. And, you know, that's time based. That's not really quality. Steam is a pile of garbage and Valve is just now starting to fix it up. Whether you agree to that or not is an opinion, but that's mine. That Steam is just terrible right now. And hey, the Epic Game Store is no better, right? But look, they've got competition. And this is something Tim Sweeney said that I want I want to emphasize a little bit on. The only way to combat the Steam monopoly, because there is a monopoly, that's not a debatable point. Steam dominates the entire PC market in margins that are unfathomed. When when you're faced with a monopoly like Steam, if you want to compete with that, you have to go with exclusives. Because given the choice, given the choice of Steam and something else, the vast majority of gamers are going to choose Steam. Now, I'm not talking to you, the user of GOG. I'm not talking to you, the user of Origin. I'm talking about the vast majority of gamers out there will use Steam. You can have the better store. You can have better features. Features, better features, and this this has been argued many times. I mean, the DOJ... Uh, in Department of Justice hearings with Microsoft and their monopoly trials and everybody, you can have better features to combat these monopolies, these monopolistic practices. You can have a better store. You can have a better experience. It can be so much better. But given the choice between that better experience and Steam, which is the market leader, gamers are going to choose Steam. Having a better product is not enough. You can disagree with me all day. As a consumer, I want a better product, but it's not enough. Just look at Twitch. Let's look at Twitch as an example. Twitch is not the better product. When it comes to features and experience and and how live streaming is done, YouTube and Mixer do a lot of better things than Twitch. It is not the better product. It isn't. But it has the market share. It has the mind share. It's not necessarily monopolistic as, as Steam. But Twitch is lacking in a lot of ways, but people still use it. The better product doesn't always win. Anybody with any kind of business savvy knows this. The better product doesn't always win. You have to do other things. You have to get people to use your product instead of your competitors. Now, software exclusivity is not as evil as I think people think it is. 
Hardware exclusivity requires you to buy an entire machine. Like look at Apple. Look at look at Apple and Android and look at Sony and Microsoft. That requires you to buy a specific piece of hardware in order to use software. That combination I do not like. Okay. I don't like that. But software exclusivity, which can run on my PC with a small download, and I can run it alongside something else. I have no problem with that. I've been dual. I was dual booting my computers with Windows and Linux and all kinds of other stuff for a very long time. There's stuff that only works in those platforms, in those gardens, in those in those areas. But it's software exclusivity. You got to understand software exclusivity is not that evil if your PC can run both without one tainting or hindering the other. If one product is not tainting or hindering the other and they can run perfectly alongside each other, I don't see anything wrong as long as I can get to the product. Again, the walled garden of the Epic Game Store, the walled garden of the Steam Marketplace is what's driving people crazy right now. But we're gamers. Shouldn't the game matter? So what? You don't get Steam achievements. You can get achievements right in the game. You don't get anything special for having Steam achievements other than clout. So what if you don't have those achievements? You can have achievements right in the game. Borderlands 1 gave you a ton of XP if you got achievements. So what? You can't have your workshop right off the bat. So far, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a good argument, but so far you can't. So what if you can't have full blown mods day one? What game ship would, would mod support day one these days? Not a whole lot. There are some, but not a whole lot shipped with mod support on day one. So what? You can't have your forums, your built-in forums. I'll, I'll be honest. Hand up right now. I never use Steam forums. If I have a problem, I never use Steam forums. I go to the, I go to the subreddit or I go to the, the, the company's forums that they have. I never use that. So if you have to have that, I don't understand why that's such an important thing. I really don't. So if you don't understand my, my, my viewpoint on this, I think the emphasis is being thrown around and a lot of misinformation. Listen here, people are making up stuff every newer. They're making up new things about Epic Game Store that's just it's just mind boggling and appalling. It's, it's like borderline politics type of, of arguments. It's fear mongering. You're scaring people off the platform, calling the calling the Epic Game Store spyware. Talking about your account will be compromised if you use the Epic Game Store? When it happens on Steam billions of times a year, people's accounts get compromised all the time to get TF2 hats, to get to get Counter-Strike skins, to get knives, to get all this anti-consumer stuff that Valve does. People's accounts get compromised all the time. But yet now is super important on the Epic Game Store because it's threatening your your precious flowers and gardens in Steam. You've got four hundred and fifty dollars in Steam monies from selling all kinds of of cards and, and and trading skins. And you don't want that to be compromised. You can't spend that trapped money from Steam on something else. So you're going to blame Epic because you're trapped on Steam. Your money is trapped, but it's Epic's fault. Uh, no. No. This is about video games, everybody. This is about video games. You can play the games. You can't play God of War. You can't play you can't play The Last of Us on your PC. That's a reason to be concerned. That's a reason to be a little bit, you know, perturbed. You can play Borderlands 3 on your PC. And guess what? You'll be able to play cross-platform with consoles thanks to the Epic Game Store. This is something that Steam has been moving very slow on for years to get cross-play. Remember, remember they were trying to put Steam on the Xbox and Steam on this? It was like moving really slow. Out comes Fortnite. They do it in less than a year. Suddenly we got cross-play. But everybody hates that. Everybody wants crossplay, but we hate Epic because they're giving developers the ability to have crossplay just by using their bare storefront that ha doesn't have the wall garden that Steam has. 
But yet and still, your gaming experience will be enhanced by 10,000 times because you'll be able to play with PS4 and Xbox players that don't have a PC. But you're mad because you don't have your workshop. You don't have your forums. You're mad because because Epic Game Store used a local file to, to import your Steam friends rather than going to the Steam API. So you've dubbed it spyware. You're mad. Not because of the game, but because of the freaking storefront and the freaking walled garden. You need to take a step back, gamer. I'm talking to you, gamer. You need to take a step back and look at what is actually being offered here. A video game, a walled garden, and an ecosystem. People get invested, man. It's like it's like Mac versus PC. It, it, it's like... It, 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 it's like PS4 versus Xbox. It's like it's like iOS versus Android. They get invested in their ecosystem so much that it becomes a religion cult type of thing where I can't use anything else. And like I said, those situations, I can understand hardware exclusivity being an issue because that's a very expensive decision. You make that decision, you're thousands of dollars in the hole to go try something else. We're talking about a free download of a, of a game store, a free download, people. Free. They're not charging you anything. Seriously. This, this, this culture of just overreaction to the most meaningless things, it's okay to be passionate. It's okay to, to, to express your disdain or concern with the company and how they're doing something. But we are focusing on the wrong things. These are, these are very minor things that are being propelled as being super important. There are much bigger issues than this. Much bigger issues. And Valve is behind a lot of them. But we, we, we give them a pass for some reason. It's okay for Valve to have loot boxes, but it's not okay for EA to have them. This is what I'm talking about. Oh, man. All right. I'm down for my soapbox. Check it out, guys. Borderlands 3 on the Epic Game Store, exclusive for six months. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to play it. Use the code Buona when you check out on the Epic Game Store to help your boy out. Okay. Let's move on to the next thing. Uh, I This is why I warned you. This is why we're only doing two stories. Let's talk about Anthem. BioWare's Anthem. If you don't know what Anthem is, it is a looter shooter created by BioWare. Came out earlier this year. Uh, it's competition to Warframe, competition to The Division 2. I've talked about both of these on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash wanna check it out. I got reviews of, of Division. I got the first 20 hours of uh, War, uh, first 20 hours of Anthem review, and I do believe I have an initial impression video for Division 2. You can check both of those out on the channel. Uh, Kotaku put out a massive post and I don't generally read Kotaku. You probably noticed that on my, on my outlets that I don't talk about, I don't use Kotaku stuff because I don't have a lot of respect for the site. I have my reasons. Um, but this, this article by Jason Schreier, 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 you know, it's a good article. It's very long. That's my issue with this very long winded. It could be cut by a third and say the same thing. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's basically a mini novel. It's like a mini documentary in text form. And it's gotten a lot of press and even caught the, 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 it even caught the attention of the Bioware executives. So much so that they had a rebuttal within minutes. It's called How, Bi How Bioware's Anthem Went Wrong. And if you, just as a, excuse me, just as a preface, if you haven't followed my, my, my journey on Anthem, I, I had a generally good impression with the game. It was to me it was like average to above average in a lot of ways. And that reflects its 55 score on Metacritic. To me, that's like that's like barely above average. Even though people think 55 is terrible, to me that's like above average. 50 should be average, right? That I mean, that's the way I do math. Um, and I, I praised the game's loop in terms of combat. I praised its general story. It was a decent story. But it was plagued with a lot of of this of just just disjointed systems and 
bugs and I, I got a lot of bad things to say about that I, on my blog post on one of that tv slash blog i talk about why anthem is the way it is you know why i think of the way it is and just one day I, I was playing it even with all these issues i was playing it and then one day on stream i think it was a patch day or one day ever patch days i just i got fed up i was like well i'm just gonna wait i i think i, I oh i remember what it was i encountered a mission bug where we kept getting teleported back to the beginning after we hit a spot where it was telling us to go for the mission. So it was a mission bug. And I said, that's it. I can't play this game anymore. I just can't play this game anymore. I'm going to wait until they fix it. And I uninstalled it. And I haven't played it since, except to test my new video card and my new system. Um, so that's where I'm at. I'm not playing Anthem right now. I think it needs to bake some more. And that's kind of what this article alludes to. It is a great story. Let me tell you, if you got time, sit back and, and drink some coffee or some tea and read this post over on Kotaku. I will link it. It goes way back to to when the, the whole thing was conceived and it was called Beyond. That was the name of the game way back when. And this article goes and interviews 19 current and former Bioware employees to get information. OK, and the, the, the people are anonymous because they're really not supposed to be doing this. Um, there's a lot to this. And it stems from uh, the, the whole lack of focus. I'm trying to summarize this as much as possible because there is so much in this. It goes back to when the game was first conceived and nobody really knew what they wanted to do. They just wanted a game where you can go out with friends, do stuff in a harsh environment, and then come back and talk about it. That's what the article kind of pitches as the original Anthem theme. But all the little details in between that changed dramatically over the years, shifted focus, people left the company, leadership was changed multiple times. And I have experienced this firsthand in my workforce experience I have experienced this exact thing. I was on the project. Management shifted multiple times on a, on a seemingly unfixable thing. And it was a train wreck just continuing to move and just never stopped. And that seems to be what this, this Anthem thing turned out to be. There's just, there were so many problems with the development process with lack of focus. Okay, let's talk about the lack of focus thing first. So many times, as this article points out, nobody knew what they were building. They had no idea what the game was going to be about. They couldn't, they could, if, if you asked them what the game was, they couldn't tell you because the focus of the game kept shifting. And it, it's, it's, it's one, of those, one of those situations where if you're working on something and you don't know what you're building and management can't make up their mind what they're building, you go into this cyclical loop of uncertainty and just meaningless work and time just continues to move on. Next thing you know, six years have passed. We got a release in six months. Oh, my God, what do we do? That's what happened with Anthem. They were in this loop of just uncertainty and just nothing was getting done. No decisions were being made. And then all of a sudden they had to release in the fall of 2018 and they were not ready. So they went through a, I believe it was six to 12 months of just extreme last minute. Oh my God, let's ship it. And it kind of makes sense. If you look at the state of the game, there are so many unfinished and and so many incomplete systems in Anthem that it kind of it, 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 it speaks to that. And a big, big, big bullet point of this article is just the work atmosphere that was at BioWare. Here's a quote that says, many say that their co-workers had to take stress leave. A doctor mandated period of weeks or even months worth of vacation for their mental health. One former Bioware developer told me that they would frequently find a private room in the office, shut the door, and just cry. People were so angry and sad all the time. Depression and anxiety are an epidemic within Bioware. I can't 
I actually cannot count the amount of stress casualties we had on Mass Effect Andromeda or Anthem, said a third former Bioware developer in an email. A stress casualty at Bioware means someone has such a mental breakdown from a stress, from the stress, they're just gone for one to three months and they don't come back sometimes. Wow. So, I, I mean, different takes, you know, it's, it's, some people may see it as that. Some people may see it as a party because I've been in stressful environments and some people thrive off that stuff. But that's that's harsh. If you can if you can justify that, that's true. That's something that's actually happening that, that people get so stressed. I mean, it, and it's a documented fact that so many of the original Bioware developers have left, not just the big names. A lot of people that work there from the, the early days are gone. They left. That kind of backs up this story. Um, and another big thing about this, this whole Anthem story is what, something that we gamers kind of propagated. Gamers like to compete. Let me tell you, man, there could be anything going on in gaming and a lot of video gamers choose sides. Whether it's a side to an argument, whether it's a, a platform, whether it's a game, Warframe versus Destiny, whether it's uh, World of Warcraft versus Final Fantasy, it's Battlefield versus Call of Duty. We just have to choose sides, man. It's Epic Game Store versus Steam. I just talked about that. And one of the things that we gamers propagated with this whole Bioware thing is the development studios. We even gave them names. We got the A team, the B team, and the C team. We got the... The Edmonton studio, which is the A-team, these guys made uh, Mass Effect and um, uh, Dragon Age, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, then we got the Austin team, which made uh, Star Wars, The Old Republic. And then we got the Montreal team, I think it's Montreal, which is like the, the C-team. So essentially, when you refer to the A-team, those are supposed to be the good developers. Oh, Montreal didn't work, or, I'm sorry, Edmonton didn't work on that, so that's why the game sucks. And the problem is right now in, in this article, um, that kind of attitude was propagating in the, throughout Bioware itself internally. The Edmonton team essentially were uh, cocky and arrogant, according to the article, that they looked down upon the Austin team. They looked, them at, looked at them as grunts. And we'll even talk about what they think about with the C team. That's kind of messed up. And a lot of the creativity and the ideas and the design decisions from this article seem to come from Edmonton and Munch, uh, not Munch, um, the, uh, the, the guys over in, in Austin were screaming, hey, listen, guys, we found out that in Star Wars Your Republic, this didn't work. We noticed that you're doing the same thing in Anthem. Um, maybe we should learn from that mistake that we found out and not do this. And that fell on deaf ears. So this article goes into it's just so much detail about where it's really long. That's why it's hard for me to really focus on any one part of it. I'm trying to talk about the bullet points that I received out of it. From how it was called beyond to, to what the ideas were to the pitch. This is another thing I want to talk about. The One of the pitch to the executives, um, this is something that the Bioware do. Every every year, they they create a demo for the employees to take home and play and come back with, with uh, to come back with feedback. So in 20, I think it was 2016, uh, they sent everybody home with a demo of Anthem. One of the executives came back and said that it was terrible and he thought it was boring. So what they did was, Get this. They they tried to spruce it up to impress this guy. And they added flight because it was the big differentiator between it and other games. So they added flight to impress this one guy. And he liked it. So flight stayed in. This is like year five or six into development. And they kept they, they, they talked about this. They kept adding and removing flight many times throughout the entire development life cycle. But they wanted to impress this one guy, and he added flight, and he liked it, therefore it stayed. 
So flight was added really late in the development cycle, which kind of explains why flight sucked in the beginning. You know, when we got our hands on the demo, flight felt really bad because it was added late. And that's another theme of this article is that Bioware just ran out of time. They really started development in the last six months of the development cycle. So six months leading up to the launch, that's when development really production development. They call it pre-production and production. Production development really began, really, really began six months leading up to it. And one of the biggest issues they talk about, and this is not the first time I've heard this, um, is uh, frostbite. Frostbite is the engine used by, it's made famous by EA and DICE, main, namely with the Battlefield series. And as an end user of Frostbite, I'm a fan because Frostbite really looks good and it performs reasonably, reasonably well in a very, very large setting. So it was perfect for Battlefield. I can't really say, it's, it's also perfect for Battlefront too. I think those types of games, it works really well. I can't say that there's a Frostbite RPG that I really thought was great. So this article goes on to say that Frostbite is full of razor blades, as one former Bioware developer put it. Uh, this engine is so bad in terms of uh, just documentation and how things are written and how things are structured that anybody outside of DICE who tries to use it I mean, is uh, I think the word is a lot of terms for this where there's undocumented engines and stuff that people try to take a, take over and use that they can't, but they just could not could not cut it. And the people behind Dragon Age Inquisition in 2011 said the same thing. They said that trying to use Frostbite to do anything takes twice as long. So here's a, here's a compounded issue that's happening. I think that's the word of the day for the situation. It's a compounded issue. Here you have a really bad development process. You've got shifting leadership. You've got lack of focus. So let's say you have a bug or a software hurdle or hurdle to get over. Not only do you have all these problems process and procedure wise, but now you've got a really, really, really convoluted engine to use and it takes twice as long, sometimes three times as long, to fix a small bug. This is what, this is what, I, when you talk about the story, man, you kind of feel sorry for the developer, for, for the employees that had to go through this. You kind of feel sorry for them because this is like the worst case scenario for a lot of development teams out there. You've got this big overbearing pressure from EA to release in the fiscal year because that's what you committed to. You're doing everything wrong. You're taking way too long to do it. And you're using bad tools on top of that. That kind of leads credence to the whole stress leave thing. That's, that's a very bad situation to be in. Here's a quote. Frostbike is like an in-house engine with all the problems that entails... Is poorly documented, hacked together, and so on, with all the problems of an externally sourced engine. Nobody you actually work with designed it, so you don't know why this thing works the way it does, why this is named the way it is. This is from a developer. Throughout the early years in development, the Anthem team realized that many of its ideas they've originally conceived would be difficult, if not impossible, to create on Frostbite. And I've, I've, like I said, I've heard this from other people. That the engine is not as flexible as Unreal. And I think that's what uh, this executive here, I keep referring to him as an executive. Let me get his name here. Uh, it's Peter something, I think. Uh, I'm probably going to mess up his name. Um. I'll find it at some point. There's so much to talk about here, guys. I'm so, it's it's kind of hard. It's like it's like it's like Anthem. It's hard to stay focused. He he put out a directive. This executive he put out a directive that every game at EA should use the same tech. We're not going to license any more engines. We got Frostbite. Frostbite can do anything. Apparently, that's what he believes. I believe personally, Frostbite can do shooters, 
massively world big world shooters like uh like uh Battlefront 2 and it can do things like Battlefield uh but I don't know if it's it, it can do a looter shooter. And I think that's what the team in Anthem found out. That you know, you've got a lot of static stuff in those situations. You you got some progression, but it's not like a looter shooter progression. Here's another great quote. It's hard enough to make a game. It's really hard to make a game where you have to fight your own tool set all the time. I think that that kind of sums up the whole frostbite thing. So moving on, it's, it's, it's so much more, man. Uh, this game was in pre-production for four years. Pre-production for four years. The last couple years, I think the la- I think I said this, the last six months is where production actually really kicked in. I don't know what to say, man. Anthem is 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 is, is, is a it's a cobbled together mess that has some bright points. It has some really good bright points. You can tell where the work went in from the developers, but it's like putting together seven different puzzle puzzles. Let's say you get the same picture, right? You get the same picture, but you've got four different versions of that picture and four different puzzle boxes. And you toss all the pieces on the table and you tell the gamer to put the picture together. You're going to have some duplicate parts. You're going to have some things that don't fit. You're going to have some things that are, that, that are outside the boundaries. It's going to have different shapes and sizes. It's really, really, really disjointed, this game. And honestly, it's sad to see because it has such great... Potential. Who in the world, who in their right mind wouldn't want to play an Iron Man looter shooter? Like, honestly, that just, that sounds great. Patrick Sudolin, that's his name. Patrick Sudolin, he's the one who, I think he's a tall guy. He's the one who said that everybody's got to use, uh, everybody's got to use, uh, everybody's got to use Frostbite. Oh, man. So, it, it's really, really sad to talk about this because I know that the team at Bioware is working hard. Well, I, I'm not going to say I know. I assume that the team at Bioware is working really hard on Anthem to make things better, to improve what's there for the players who are still playing, which I got to say, I have respect for you guys. You players who are still playing right now and are, are, are remaining true, I, I, I got to say I'm impressed. Because that game is broken on all kinds of levels. All kinds of levels. I'm not going to talk about much more because there's, there's so much I just don't, I just don't remember. There's just so much in this article. I'm scrolling through it right now. It's just miles and miles and miles and miles of text. But if I could summarize this in a couple sentences, I can say that Anthem had a really troubled development with, with shifting management, shifting focuses, and it, they realized it way too late that we need to ship this thing. And they brought in this guy who said they brought in this, uh, this, uh, executive, I think exec producer, they brought in a head, head, head guy who, yeah, executive producer, Mark Dara, who basically got them to ship. He just said, just finish what you're doing. Stop changing your mind. He made decisions and the game shipped in a broken state. That's why, I mean, some people say, Oh, EA didn't give Bioware enough time. This article really summarizes how I feel about that statement. It's not always EA. Publishers give you deadlines. They give you they give you reasonable deadlines and you can't blame it all on them. This is a broken dev shop, period. We're seeing it with Bethesda as well. And we're starting to see the cracks at Blizzard. This is a broken dev shop. You can't blame that on the publisher. Okay, you can't blame that when they're fighting each other internally. When you've got the high and mighty Edmonton people looking down on the Austin people, you can't blame EA for that. When you've got, okay, you can't blame the frostbite stuff on EA because if they're pushing frostbite on everybody, that could definitely hurt things. You can't blame that on EA. Um, but still, man, it, it, you, can't, you can't fix something like this. To say that they, if they were given more time... I really think they just would have spun their wheels until the last minute. Again, they have this thing called Bioware Magic that they mentioned in this article where they don't worry about anything because it'll all come together somehow. I kid you not. 
They don't even. They, it's like magic. They go, well, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do, but do the Bioware magic. Will it'll happen? Somehow things will work out. And I, I <laughs> haven't been in the middle of a uh, crunch. It takes a lot of personal sacrifice, stress, and stuff to make that happen. And to just shrug it off as magic is not only it's not only uh, disrespectful for the people who sweat blood and tears to just call it magic and not hard work, but it's also really, really short-sighted and irresponsible to even rely on something like that when things are bad. They say, well, at least we've got BioWare magic. <laughs> That's irresponsible. That's really bad. And I would leave the company, too, if somebody said that. It's like, it's okay if we're behind. You guys will pull it together somehow. Ha, ha, ha. I'm going to get a drink. You know, that's disrespectful. He's like, oh, I guess I'm, I'm not leaving the office for three months. Stress, man. It's stressful. So with all that said, this article came out. And then BioWare responded. Um. They, it's a very PR heavy statement. They, they really ran this through the PR things and they're, they're praising the team saying this was a team effort. We don't want to single out people, blah, blah, blah. But here's a quote right here that, um, I think is why they're getting ridiculed for this. Cause the, the general consensus from the court of public opinion is that this was a bad response. I think it was a decent response until they got to this. They said, people in this industry put so much passion and energy into making something fun. I agree with that. We don't see the value in tearing down one another or one another's work. We don't believe articles that do that make our industry or and craft better. Listen here, man. That is so, that's such, that's such a terrible thing to say. That's deflection. That's not taking responsibility. That's basically calling Kotaku a villain. For reporting what employers are saying, employees are saying. Not once in this Kotaku article did I see anything personal or. It was a very well written article. I didn't see anything that was biased. What I saw was a summation of what employees and former and current employees were reporting. It was very, very neutral from the Kotaku standpoint, which is rare these days in journalism. It's very, very neutral. So to kind of point the finger at Kotaku and go, you shouldn't tear us down um, is a gross, a gross stance of just ignoring what, was, what, what just happened over the past six, seven years. And there's a lot of deflection. They said that, you know, we put a lot of focus on better planning to avoid crunch time. And it was not a major topic of feedback in our internal postmortems. I okay, well, there's a problem there. So what we what we see what I see here is a, a big wall of denial and a big wall of of just hand I think somebody called it hand waving, like Jedi hand waving. This is this is not the bio where you're looking for. Move along. Sweep it under the rug. This is not this is not this is not what you're looking for. Our full focus, this is from the article uh, from the Bioware response. Our full focus is on our players and continue to make Anthem everything it can be for our community. Thank you to our fans and your support. We do what we do for you. That's probably true from certain perspectives. But the way you're doing it is, is, is it really deserves. Here's, here's the point I'm making here. This deserves to be addressed. Your development process on Anthem needs to be highlighted. And I think there's a quote in this. Yeah, there is a quote that says that um, there were people that hoped that that Dragon Age Inquisition would do bad because it would teach Bioware a lesson as to not. This is not how you do not how you build games. So I don't think I don't think they've learned that lesson because Anthem sold so much. It was successful from a sales standpoint. And I don't think they're they're learning that this is not how you do it. And here's the problem with entertainment. Here's the problem with entertainment. A lot of people are like, well, if you don't buy it, they won't do it. It ain't that simple. Not with entertainment. 
if we're talking about a, a, a household product like a, a faulty VCR or I said VCR, a faulty refrigerator or a faulty uh, microwave or, you know, your, your, your table falls apart, you can easily vote with your wallet on that because that's pretty, that's pretty, that's static. I mean, that's, that's like objective. That's logical. Entertainment is not logical. Entertainment is opinion, fun base, depends on a lot of emotional variables. You can't just say don't vote with your wallet because somebody may want to play that crap. That, that stuff that's out there. They want to play that. They want to do that. You can't just vote with your wallet because there's people out there that want to do it. They may not know all the issues. There's there's a lot of information that that's just not available when it comes to entertainment. It's not like a hard, hard core product like a table or uh, an appliance you know where it either breaks or it doesn't and you can just go out you know if you just it just develops a bad reputation and even then in those products there's a lot of gray area that people get around you can't just say vote with your wallet okay you can you you can educate like what i'm doing in this podcast you can educate people as to what happened what's happening with the game what's wrong but to tell people to vote with their wallet is like saying, don't go see that movie. They're going to go see the movie if they want to watch it or not. Okay. Boycotts, that's why boycotts and stuff like that just don't work. What does work is when a game is so bad, not to, not, I'm not telling people to vote with their wallets, but when a game is so bad and it's so broken that when the developer comes out with another game, it doesn't sell because of that. Not because you're telling people to vote with their wallet, but because it was just so awful that people who bought that game, they see the next one, they go, I ain't buying that. Look at War Z. War Z is a perfect example. That developer who developed War Z, everything he touches, nobody buys. They still have a following, but... He has developed a reputation, Sergey. He has developed a, re a reputation that whatever he touches is going to fail. And that's not based on voting with your wallet. That's based on just experience, people experiencing bad product. Really, really bad product. That's where the product speaks for itself. And I think that's what needs to happen to BioWare. And I think they're really close to that. Blizzard is, is experiencing it too. Overwatch is on a massive decline. Diablo is laughable now. World of Warcraft is a ready is ready to, is ready to kill itself. They're, they're ready to go. It's ready to go. It's on its last legs. They've revived Classic and it's ready to go. So these big studios, which once seemed unstoppable, are now starting to falter because people are starting to see through it. And then you got other titles like Fortnite coming up from a studio that made Unreal Tournament. You know. <laughs> that this new generation is latching onto and loving and the old guard is like, well, we want to do Fortnite too, but you can't. They're winning the hearts and minds of these kids. So whatever Epic does in terms of a store, now the Epic game store is building on that trust. They're, they're, they're betting on the future. You guys who stuck on the steam, steam wall garden, they're living in the past. Epic is betting on this, this Fortnite generation. These kids, they're going to grow up. They're going to get jobs. They're going to get degrees. And they're going to have Fortnite still installed. And they're going to be playing stuff on the Epic Game Store. So the hearts and minds of people are, one, not at telling them to vote with their wallet. But it's their realization of a bad product. And there's only so much fanboyism out there. I mean, you can only fanboy Anthem so long before you go, all right, this game's ridiculous. It's happening everywhere, man. Look at, look at like, uh, Albion Online is trying to make a comeback right now. They're trying to win the hearts and minds of people. Uh, look what happened with Arc Age and how so many people just stopped playing. They weren't voting with their wallet. Nah, they just saw what happened and they don't want it to happen. They're not going to go through it again. It's like a mind shift. It's like, you, 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 it's, it's like a post-mortem rather than a preventative thing. If people can remember what happened in the past, they won't, they won't repeat it in the future. That's the point I'm making. Don't tell people to vote with your wallet. Say, remember what happened. 
You know, focus on remembering what happened. Do you want to go through that again? If you do, then buy the game. If you don't, then don't. Because that's what that's the thing. And that's why a lot of people, that's why I, I didn't get really mad at people that said, well, this is an EA game, so you know what's going to happen. I mean, EA has a bad track record. It's a valid point. A lot of EA games have bad track records. But then you got people like, you got uh, Response Entertainment, which is like the most anti-EA company under EA, which doesn't use Frostbite, by the way. They use Source, which didn't use any EA marketing, pre-marketing. When they made Apex Legends, they nearly dethroned Fortnite. It's kind of shifting back to Fortnite now, but in terms of Mindshare and Twitch and, and YouTube. But they nearly dethroned Fortnite off of no marketing, pre-marketing, and simply shipped a complete game. Who knew? Who knew that if you shifted a complete, if you shift a complete game, that people would actually play it and like it? It wasn't this early access, half-baked, half-done stuff. It was a complete game. So check this out, guys. Why? What went wrong with Anthem? How Bioware's Anthem went wrong? It was incomplete. It was nowhere near complete. I don't think anybody out there who says that it was it was a complete game at launch knows what they're talking about. That That should go without debate. The game wasn't done. Still isn't done. And Bioware Magic just didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, and and players are, are, are hoping that they can pull off the magic post mortem. But I think you're you're looking at you're looking at something that's beyond repair. This is my opinion on Anthem. I think Anthem is beyond repair. I really do. I think there's only so much you can do to a video game without just completely scrapping it. Look at Final Fantasy 14. That game was beyond repair. Final Fantasy 14 was beyond repair. It had very similar issues. It had the old guard. It had arrogant people that wouldn't listen. And it shipped a crappy product and it failed. And the only way they fixed it was that they shut the game down and they just wiped it clean, clean and started over. And honestly, that's the only thing I think Anthem can do right now. That's the only thing I think they can do. I think they should just shut it down, just close down the live service, Give players who have access to the game access to the next one. Do exactly what Final Fantasy XIV did. If you bought Anthem, you'll get access to Anthem Reborn. Heck, even use the name Anthem Reborn. Shut down for three to four years and finish the game. Don't release a half-release game. Just finish it. And if EA doesn't give you enough time, then just don't do it. Because right now, Bioware is sitting at a point to where in time where they're either going to be made or, or not made by their reputation. They've got a good reputation for past games, and that's starting to falter. This new generation, I call it the Fortnite generation. This is like the, the 8 to 14-year-olds. This, this 8 to 14-year-old generation, they don't care about Bioware. And when they get older, Bioware is not going to be a name for them. It's going to be us old folks. Oh, I remember Dragon Age, Mass Effect. We're good. They were like, well, Fortnite. You know, so they have to make the right decisions now. And I had high hopes for Anthem. I was really disappointed with it. Really, really disappointed with Anthem. I had really high hopes. I'm a big fan of the looter shooter genre. You know me. I play a lot of Warframe. I put quite a few hours in Division 2, which turned out to be a really good game, by the way. It's like the opposite of what Anthem was, even though it has issues. Um, it's just a really sad story. It's just, this, is not, this is not something you wish for. This is not something I'm happy to, to report on. This is not something that makes me feel good. This is depressing. This is a one great studio that's got... That's got anxiety and depression issues ran, running rampant throughout their organization. And management, just they just put up a blog post saying that they don't exist. They just basically said that they don't exist. So these, these developers are trapped. I feel really bad for them. Check it out, guys. Kotaku.com has the article. It's massive. If you're going to read it. Make sure I actually had to pause reading this and go eat some food and then come back because I ran out of energy. It was just that lengthy. How Bioware's Anthem went wrong. Check it out.
And that concludes episode game chat. With, game chat episode. What is this? Episode game chat with one of 132. I don't even know what day it is. That was really long. Episode 133. That concludes episode 133 of game chat with Buona. I told you, man, this is why I only limited to those two stories because they, they just, they, they could be really long winded. Please guys follow my stream at twitch.tv slash Buona. I stream pretty much daily except for Wednesdays and Sundays. And uh, we play a lot of stuff. We talk and we hang out. So if you want to hang out with our community, talk with me about various gaming topics, stuff I've talked about in this podcast, come by the stream at twitch.tv slash Buona. Also, I'm over at youtube.com slash Buona, where I post a lot of short videos. I post, I cross post this podcast and tech talk with Buona and a bunch of other tech news and reviews over there. Instagram.com slash Buona for the occasional snap of my dog, my doggy dog, my Shih Tzu Kent. You guys will love him over there on Instagram dot com slash wanna uh we're, we're working on merchandise right now we're on spreadshirt but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna promote it as much because i'm i'm having problems with the store but if you want to buy from spreadshirt right now the 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 uh, urls at shop that spreadshirt.com slash wanna tv uh we have some issues with international orders so we're trying to work that out with spreadshirt um and this podcast is at buona.tv slash podcast along with game chat wanna subscribe on spotify itunes google play Good old fashioned RSS or just download the MP3 directly from my site over on Buona.tv slash podcast. It's been a big one. Been a long time since I did an hour plus episode of anything, but I thought these were two juicy topics that are really big in gaming right now. And they really have some important points that I like to talk about. It's my passion. I love doing this stuff. Thank you all for listening. This is Game Chat Born episode 133. And I will see you all next time. Have a great day.